terrified of public speaking, terrified mm -hmm. of communicating her proposition to the audience. Mm -hmm. And yet, <laughs> it was a bit embarrassing, but um, they, they came to a session for the, for the first time and go and make a mistake. Go and take advice. Okay, that sounds good. I'll try that. Ah, didn't work. Okay, I've learnt. So I think there's acting and performing, and I, I really like acting, which takes you into, you know, like Shakespeare and Chekhov and film and television roles. And performing is, and don't be ashamed. Don't worry about being judged because everybody's wrong about the future. Welcome to the Startup Journeys Founders Unplugged podcast. I'm your host, Paul King, and today's episode is powered by the expertise of a seasoned professional in entertainment and corporate communication. Meet Peter Brown, a visionary with two decades in entertainment and another two in corporate communication. Now he combines these realms to empower startup founders, business executives, and individuals from all walks of life to communicate with clarity, authority, and passion. Peter shares invaluable insights from his journey, from overcoming fear of public speaking to crafting compelling narratives. Peter guides startup founders and business executives, and even those in education, through the process of becoming confident and passionate presenters. Join us on this episode as we explore the core elements of Peter's training, whether you're tackling nerves, lack of confidence, or notorious death by PowerPoint, Peter's strategies, techniques, and processes promise to transform your communication skills. Get ready to embark on a journey of fearless communication. Peter, welcome to the Startup Journeys Founders Unplugged podcast. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great to have you on and um, look forward to... Uh, gaining all the insights from your many years of experience in the entertainment industry and, and helping um, startup founders on their pitches and storytelling. But to start with, uh, you have a long uh, history as an actor and um, I'm interested in what motivated you to be an actor and what were some of the highlights of your acting career? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess... What motivated me to be an act, an actor um, was that I sort of, when I was at uni, uh, the the you know people were putting on plays, and I thought, oh, I'd really like to be involved in that, you know, like mm -hmm. helping put on a show yeah. uh, backstage. And when I went to talk to the guy about you know joining him, he had signs up around the campus, you know, we're looking for people to you know help us yeah. with the show. I said, oh, I'd really like to help out backstage. And he said, oh, I, actually, you'd be really good for one of the one of the <laughs> actors. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, like sort of gradually got into that and found that I, I really liked it and mm -hmm. I really enjoyed doing it. And, um, and, and people sort of responded well to what I was doing, got a lot of encouragement and, uh, you know, eventually, after a number of shows at uni, applied for, and after the third attempt, I ended up getting into NIDA and and sort of going along that path. So it was it was finding a bit of a vocation where I had tried law, um, I'd tried I'd, I'd done a lot of hospitality jobs, you know, like mm -hmm. just just didn't really have a purpose and went to uni with the intention of doing social work because I thought that might be something that I mm -hmm. could would, would want to do and sort of fell into uh, entertainment and just loved it. You know, just I loved mm -hmm. studying drama and, and after the first initial, like, experience of, of horror, um, found mm -hmm. that I really enjoyed and had a propensity for acting. Um, yeah, and so... In terms of highlights, uh, I think the the two. I, I mean, I, I did a lot of. Well, when I say two, there was two sort of aspects of 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 
being in the entertainment industry that I really liked. And one was the activity of starting with nothing and with a group of people coming up with ideas and then developing those ideas and putting on a show, uh, a little bit like, you know, Mickey Rooney and <laughs> Judy Garland, you know, let's put on a show, you know, <laughs> and uh, that was just exciting, that whole process. Yeah. And then the other side was, um, you know, being given a role and 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 bringing that role to life. Uh, in terms of highlights in that aspect, um, uh, in that aspect of of being given a role and bringing it to life, the highlight for me was a a character called Alfred the Hot Water Bottle <laughs> in a show called Johnson and Friends. And uh, mm. so I think there's acting and performing and. I really like acting, which takes you into, you know, like Shakespeare and Chekhov and mm -hmm. film and television roles. And performing is 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 a bit more, um, a, a bit more declamatory, a bit more um, showy, a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, performance is the right word. You you're really performing, and so the Alfred the hot water bottle was a real performance, you know, because it wasn't human, it wasn't naturalistic, you know. You, yeah. you, you've you got this, you, you're making a water bottle a believable character. So like uh, this and is it, an animated um, series. Was it an animated series? We're sort about? of. It was puppets. Was puppets, okay. Yeah, so we were in the costume of the oh, right. of the water bottle and making yeah. it making <laughs> it alive uh, within, a, yeah. within a kid's bedroom. And so... The, the skirting board of the kid's bedroom, you know, was about 10 feet high. You know, the, the, room, the, the room was just massive. So you, when you went into the set, you'd just walk into this as if you were like a little toy soldier oh, or something in amazing. a kid's bedroom. Yeah. It was just the scale of it was inspiring, and it was I guess just. This is this is all before you know. Now it's all CGI animated now, but in those days, it's very different. It sounds like it's a lot more interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think it was prior to, or just at the cusp of the digital age, you know, and um, and so digital production, which was able to to make action believable mm. uh, through you know, like an, an extension of cartoon making, you know, which is cell by cell yeah. where you, you know, have the, the foot gradually, you know, moving through cell by cell mm -hmm. animation and digital is a similar sort of process, but with artificial intelligence and that you basically say, here's the starting point, here's the end point, make it believable and yeah. bang, there it is, yeah. you know, and that, that's where it is now. But yeah. in, in that late, what would it have been late eighties, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, that was right at the cusp of that stage. So the, we were more on making action happen through, through real live action. So getting into a water bottle suit and yeah. animating it that way. Yeah. 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 So, um, Alfred, the hot water bottle, eh? that that's, that's awesome. I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the show was Johnson and Friends, and it was written by uh, a incredibly creative children's writer uh, called mm. John Patterson. Yeah. Who, um, uh, and, and basically, the show was about conflict resolution. Oh, really? So you had yeah. you had the pink elephant Johnson, and then you had a squeeze box and a toy truck and a toy robot. And they were all sort of, what are we going to do today? You know, let's go on an adventure. You know, let's build a pirate ship. Yeah. And then you'd have Alfred, the cantankerous hot water bottle under the bed, coming out, what's all this noise and bother going on? You know, I'm trying to sleep. You know, oh, what are you doing? Making a pirate ship? I know all about pirates. You know, <laughs> and then uh, calm down, Alfred. This is our pirate ship. Oh, well, I'll build another. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so it was just fantastic, uh, wonderful show. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And, and I noticed that you've worked with some iconic Australian actors as well, like Michael Caton, for example. Tell us a few stories about that. Oh, well, with Michael Caton, I've, I've worked incredibly briefly uh, with him on a show called Good Cop, Bad Cop, which mm. is, a, again, a great, great premise for a show. 
yeah. sat around sort of the wasn't, wasn't suburbs a bad of cop, Sydney. Bad cop, wasn't bad, bad, cop, bad, cop. Yeah, bad cop, bad cop. Yeah, that's correct. Bad cop, bad cop. Yeah, so I, I, but you know, so I was a couple of days on set, on set with Michael, and um, uh, you know, consummate professional, been around the traps mm -hmm. forever, still going. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So not not really much to report there, okay. other than okay. being on set with him, and and so that was my my lot with a lot of the stuff that I did was coming and going from shows, and mm -hmm. and you know, working with 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 some of those guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, not much to report there, uh, yeah, other really. than you know they're all knockabout guys who have a real talent for uh, creating characters and mm. <laughs> yeah, sure do. And in the industry, like working as an actor, you know, it, from you know working with actors myself, um, it's it's not easy, and and it's not easy for a start to 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 get work unless you're you know really high profile. Uh, and then you can be working, then you can be off. I think at the moment there's actually quite a bit of work out there, I think because of the streaming platforms and post-COVID and that. But, um, yeah, it can be can be difficult career. Um, I mean, going to NIDA is is really um, well-respected in the industry. I know to, to get into NIDA is really hard. I actually spoke with an actor friend of mine. He came from Tasmania and he said, you know, people don't take me that seriously, but if you go to NIDA then you are taken a lot more seriously and you have a lot more career opportunities. W would you agree with that? Um, oh, look, the contemporaries of mine, if you like, um, Russell Crowe was a, a contemporary of mine. I didn't know him. Uh, mm. I've met him once or twice. Yeah. But he did not go through NIDA. Okay. A and we did. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly that that perception that having been to NIDA um, means that you, th there is a guarantee, if you like, yeah. it's like a validation process. Yeah. You know, you've been to NIDA, you were there for three years, you graduated, then we know that you've got accomplished vocal skill. We know that you've got a, you, you can control your body. We know that you would have done a lot of character development exercises. We know that you would have been doing a lot of plays and been exposed to film and television processes. So we know that if we put you in a show, uh, in a TV show or whatever, you will have the necessary skills to be able to, to work professionally. So we, we, we know that. Whereas if we're taking somebody who's got no training, we don't know whether they're going to go to water Mm. And and it's mm. like oh shit you know we've got to recast and yeah. we've just lost all the time that we've invested in getting to this point yeah. and this guy's a shambles um, so so I think that that is the 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 key key element so both pathways are valid mm -hmm. uh, but they have different repercussions so you know in a sense there's in, if you apply it to startup world the accelerator world is like NIDA is that it gives you a foundation of knowledge that yeah. that gives people confidence that you know you you know what to do mm, mm. <laughs> uh, whereas if you're doing bootstrapping you're going to have to make all of the mistakes by yourself before you acquire the foundation knowledge to know what mistakes to avoid yeah it's interesting i sort of had a mix of both because in our startup we bootstrap but we did we didn't go through accelerator we went through the macquarie incubator which is has a great support program and um yourself you you go there and, and do pitch training I, I didn't i wasn't trained by you because i was in there earlier initially i was in there for quite a few years but uh yeah i was actually going to ask you that so that that's that's interesting and um yeah i mean e either way you you can be successful i guess um but interestingly i was talking with another founder uh, ben jeffries he um founded atec global there in the impact space and he has run some or oh, i think one incubator and been in a few uh or accelerator and he said for him the most effective uh, thing that he found was just getting in a room with other founders and just talking about things. And, yes. and I can actually agree with that because every time I've done that, 
because other founders they can like what, what you're doing they've got the experience in the space or they're still learning and and between you know a, a group of founders you can sort out just about everything what do you what are your thoughts on that oh totally um i did a lot of work with bankers trust um uh investment bank side mm-hmm. and in their dealing room uh as help you know in communication projects obviously yeah and so that is like a, a that that is like like financial markets is um is a really volatile industry uh in the sense that you're you're looking for opportunities amongst volatility basically you know whether that's in equities or fixed interest or foreign exchange or whatever you you're trying to work out which way the market's going to go and you're trying to speculate on on taking a position and that may be based on deep research or it may be based on instinct. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you get people coming into that environment that are highly education, uh, educated, Mm -hmm. and their education goes up against what happens in real life. Okay. And so you find that it's your education does not predict your success in that environment. Mm. It's your performance and your performance against the market, if you like. Mm. And <clears throat> pardon me, if, if you if you beat the market more than the market beats you, you're going to have a really successful career. Okay. But you're okay. also going to be beaten up a lot. <laughs> it uh, <laughs> sounds like startup world to me. <laughs> well, exactly. And so yeah. I think, you know, like that what the accelerator programs do is that they provide you with um a, a template approach uh, and and it's and, and unfortunately it gets positioned as a template for success yeah. you know like you follow it's what is it um bob dylan says uh in, instant instant in a piece and every step you take has to be approved you know like you 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 have to go this this way and you know you will have instant inner peace you know but of course it it's, it's it doesn't work that way yeah. so the real world versus the theoretical world mm. when they meet sometimes the theoretical world when you when you follow those predicted predicted pathways you you can achieve success and when that happens the academic or the theoretical world says, see, it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, why does it work? And it, and it works maybe because it just worked in that situation with those people. Whereas other people say, I apply the theory and it's useless. And so I threw the theory out the door and followed my gut instinct or, or talked to people and, you know, found my own way. So I, I think, uh, I, 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 I think that the, for, for the accelerator program itself or the incubator program, what, 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 a, what I think is really beneficial there is you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the, it's, it's almost like distilled experience um, given to you in the form of these are things that, that are going to be really beneficial for you to do. And part of that is governance. Part of that is HR. Part of that is, you know, financial 101. Uh, part of it is marketing. Part of it is branding. So there's all of these sort of things that that you can take shortcuts with distilled knowledge uh, and that, that set you up. But the market is the thing that's going to teach you. And then also the other side of it is founders who've been along the road or are going along the road and saying, I tried that. It doesn't work, you know. You know, and that's that, what this podcast is all about. Yeah and, yeah. and it's interesting you talk about success stories because success stories are great, but the reality is there's far and few between. And so, you know, when they promote, you know, all these successes, you know, there's a whole lot of other people that have, haven't made it along the way. And, um, yeah, th- those programs can be helpful. And it's interesting you talk about gut, um, I, I, I call it intuition, same thing. Um, I think that's really important as well. I think it's sometimes a combination as well. Like sometimes if you don't follow your intuition, um, then you can go down the wrong path or 
you know, I think some of those very successful people that may not have have, have the, you know, the high level training that others have, but they've got that really strong intuition can, can be very successful. I mean, anyone can be successful, but the thing is all, all the success stories are successful in different ways. So it's not really, if you follow what they did, um, you'll be successful because the other guy did the opposite and he was successful. There's so many factors involved. That's why, you know, just talk, talking about, you know, the stories of founders that made it or didn't make it and, and you know, all the problems they had along the way, I think is one of the greatest um, ways for, for new, particularly new and early stage startup founders to learn. And then if they relate to that story, then, you know, personally, then it can really help them. So, yeah, I think... One of the things on so so I worked with an organisation called JFDI Asia from 2012 to 2016, and mm-hmm. the that I worked with seven cohorts, roughly seven uh, ten uh, startups within cohorts. So over that period of time, um, I worked with you know seventy different teams, getting all of them ready for, for demo day and going through the program with them. So I was a resident in the program. I was sitting okay. beside the founders. Mm-hmm. I was doing my stuff. They were doing their stuff. And then we'd come together for the pitch sessions, which were, were, were quite frequent in those days. And, um, and one of the ideas that I got exposed to during that time was a thing called mentor whiplash. Right. Right, and so what mentor whiplash was is this mentor says you should be doing this, and this mentor oh, says no, you should be doing yeah. this, yeah. and yeah. and then another mentor is saying, well, the 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 the, the traditional path is to do this, mm. and and so you're getting all of this advice. The startup founder, particularly young and ex- inexperienced, like, oh, I, I should be doing that. Oh, hang on, if I'm doing that, I can't be doing that, and it's like ah, I don't know what to do. Or I keep trying these different things and none of them are working. Uh, and and so, you know, what 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 it boils down to in terms of that is that you have to find your own compass. Yes. And you have to trust your own um, well, you call it intuition, it's gut instinct. And but it's 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 guided. There's a book by Malcolm Blad- Gladwell called Blink, uh, mm-hmm. where um, where it the, the, and the idea of Blink is that somebody says, "What do you think about this?" and you go ah, and that that response yeah. that you have, which is immediate, is actually an accumulation of your knowledge and experience. Yes. And so your knowledge and experience combine, your, your, and everybody's, everybody's knowledge and experience is different, is Absolutely. really different. It's like snowflakes. We're all snowflakes, but everybody is completely unique. And so everybody's knowledge and experience is different, and everybody's knowledge is ex- and experience is different today to what it will be in six months, 12 months, three years' time. Yeah, and in startup, right. you're changing daily. And so that that intuition, you you need to learn to trust that. And then if you so so mentor whiplash is you're getting all of this guidance from people, and you're thinking maybe I should do financial modelling, maybe I should do this, you know, maybe I should do that. Um, don't talk to customers; they don't know what they're doing. Talk to customers; they're the only way you'll find yeah. out anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so you've you've got to learn to. Find your own compass, and that means trusting, trusting yourself. And then, alongside of that, you've got in startup world the basis, the basis of startup, and it was really well articulated in the Lean Canvas, and you know which comes from Business Canvas, but in Lean Canvas, which is your starting point for every single thing on that Lean Canvas is a guess, an assumption by you, everything. So whether it's the problem, whether it's the solution, whether it's the status quo, whether it's the revenue stream, whatever, you don't know, but Mm -hmm. you're you're guessing. So that is the 
first enact, enaction, if you like, of yeah. your intuition. I think this. And then the next process in Lean Canvas is, okay, you have, you've taken 10 minutes to fill out the Lean Canvas with your guesses. Yeah. And it's okay to be a guess. You don't have to be an authority. You're guessing, yeah. right? The next step is to go and validate all of those guesses. And every time your, your and validation is going to the market, going to customers, going to people who are on that trail, going to, to different businesses and saying, what's your experience? Whatever, wherever you go, but it's a validation process. And slowly that guess becomes a validated uh, statement, if you like. Mm -hmm. And then you're acting on that and learning. So the entire time you're looking to, to, to validate those assumptions. And so that in that process, you're acquiring knowledge really, really quickly because your guesswork is your own position and then validating is you're your bringing in other experienced insights and observations to develop new knowledge. And yeah. so you're learning really fast and you're letting your learning guide you and that guiding, guiding you is at some point in all of that guidance, you sit as an arbiter. And so then when you're getting the advice from others, it's what you do with that information that's important. Mm -hmm. And go and make a mistake. Go and take advice. Okay, that sounds good. I'll try that. Ah, didn't work. Okay, I've learned. Exactly. That does not work for me. Yeah. It might work for someone else, but it doesn't work for me. Yeah. So I'm going to try a different path. And then you might come back to that same thing and say, yeah. actually, this does work, but only when I do this. And yeah. so that, that idea of being in the lab and it's trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, and you're building up knowledge and experience that eventually gives you confidence. Yeah, yeah, great explanation. And, yeah, it's all about trial and error. And it's interesting because um, I definitely have had mentor. I thought you said mental whiplash before, but mentor whiplash, absolutely. I, I had that uh, particularly oh. at the beginning. Uh, for example, you know, another founder said, look, I have this great person that could really help you or get you in touch. And then they, I got on a call, they spent an hour with me and my head was just dizzy with information. And then we had another mentor, like all wonderful people that are trying to help <laughs> that was really insistent. This is the way you got to do it. And then I, at the end of the call, I'd be like, oh my God, what, you know, and, and then your intuition just completely goes. But after a couple of years, I was just like, okay, um, there are a few mentors out there that I can really relate to. And that's your intuition as well. These are the ones that are okay for me. Not everything they say is okay. And, and yeah, I'm going to just listen to myself and then, you know, and then I'll bring in whatever information I think may work. And then I really made an effort not to have so many mentors and not to listen to so many as well, because it can just get confusing in the end. So I yeah, totally agree with that. So that's a, I have, haven't heard of that men, mentor whiplash, but I definitely had it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, 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 that it's, you know, ultimately it's, it's about building trust in yourself. You know, you, you, you know, particularly if you're, you know, in a leadership position, uh, it, it's about building trust in yourself. And, uh, you know, if I go back to financial markets, I remember, <clears throat> pardon me, I was invited, uh, to, to come and spend a day, a day there with the foreign exchange guys. Okay. And so what they would do, and, and these were guys, at the time in their early to mid thirties that, that were running the show. Right. Right. Uh, um, the yeah, key right. guy <laughs> came out of um, university in New South Wales economics, uh, got a graduate position and by 28 was, was leading the foreign exchange team. And so that foreign exchange team was some really hardened market guys in their right. early forties that were absolute ramshackle guys who were all instinct, you know, some of them from farms. <laughs> and, and he was leading them. And so they would come in in the morning at 6 a.m. They started work, grab a coffee, 6.15, they would all be in a room and they would hear from 
the, uh, the, the bank's economist. They would hear from the overnight traders. They would hear from what people were looking at in terms of, you know, information that they were gathering from, you know, Bloomberg's and news sites. Yeah. And they would say, okay, these are the key influences that are going to affect our trading in the morning, this morning, up until, say, midday. Okay, this is, we think this, we think this, we think this. Go out and trade. Right. Right. And and then they would go out and start start trading, and it would just be the the beginning point for conversations. And so they they were exercising judgment, and and they were sometimes wrong, mm. you know. And I think you know, as I mentioned earlier, the markets is basically if you're right more than you're wrong, you're going to be successful. Yeah. If you're wrong more than you're right, you know, sorry, mate, this isn't for you. You know, maybe something else is. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know it's really tough, and sort of startup is this is sort of similar. And so, learning to trust your judgment, back your judgment, back your feelings, back your knowledge, back all of that stuff, is, is putting you in a position to make a decision. Now, if if that is that, there's another great and a story about about this sort of stuff was from the America's Cup and John Bertram, and he said that in a in a America's Cup race, and this is in the eighties as opposed yeah. to now. America's Cup races now are done in about five minutes, you know. But in the in the old days, they were two to three hours of um, you know going up up and back the cork course. And he said, in an America's Cup race, you make a thousand decisions. Mm. If you make eight hundred correct decisions, you probably win the race. Right. And so the interesting thing is that you're making 200 incorrect decisions. Yes, so 20% yes. of the decisions yeah. you make are wrong. Yep. So, so what do you do when you make a wrong decision? It's like, oh, we shouldn't have gone that way. Go back the other way. Exactly. You yeah. know? And so that, that, that I think is just fascinating. And for, I think in terms of startup, you've got to put yourself in a position where you back your judgment and make a decision and mm. do Go out and do. Go out and try that customer segment. Try SEO. Try direct marketing. Try walking around the streets with a drum and a, a whatever Just you know. With a hot water bottle. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> try and and see what happens. And it's like and and you know you 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 it, okay that didn't work. You know we'll park that and maybe try it later or maybe never try it again. But do do. And so then you th that I think starts to build you as a person who who develops knowledge and experience and then trusts their own judgment. That's yeah. where you're sort of heading towards. And then I think the other thing about it is that this whole process is and you talked earlier about some succeed, many don't. Yeah. And I have a contrary view. I think that there is success everywhere because this process of trying to build something that may or may not work actually develops skill level and develops acumen and, and develops experience and develops knowledge. And so people who have failed startups mm. actually can go somewhere else and they say, what have you been doing with the last two years? I've been trying to build a startup yeah. and in that process I developed marketing knowledge, I developed HR knowledge, I developed governance knowledge, I developed I worked with customers in all over these success, you know, we pitched just 200 times in that time, mm -hmm. in that period, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like holy crap, that is incredibly valuable experience for what we're doing. So mm -hmm. there is success created yeah. everywhere, yeah. but it's yeah. just the the ultimate yeah. success of building a unicorn didn't happen, yeah. but yeah. we developed unbelievable experience that is incredibly valuable. Look, I, yeah, I'm in total resonance with that, and that that is what this startup's about. So when I say you know those that didn't succeed, they, yeah, become a unicorn or whatever, right? And then even if you get that, like. You know, is that ultimate happiness anyway? I don't think so. <laughs> so, you know, the expression, it's all about the journey. Yes. That's what it is for me. And if, like you said, there's so much you learn, so much growth. For me, so many connections. 
yeah, I made heaps of mistakes. And then, you, you know, you move on and you learn from that and you develop yourself as a person as well. And um, so, yeah, so success can mean a lot of different things. So probably the word I shouldn't use because this startup is, this so this podcast is more about, um, you know, talking about the journey itself and, and, and uh, what you can get from that. So really totally agree with what you said and people need to keep that in mind as well. Um, so, you know, usually when we have a goal, um, we go on a journey and if we get the goal, if we don't get the goal, if we, if we do get the goal, it's like, okay, um, what's next? It's like storytelling, which is you, you're, you know, you do with, uh, you've been doing all your life, I guess, and everything's about stories. It's like you start off um, and you want to get to this goal and you have all these problems and obstacles along the way. And then when you get to the end of the journey or get to that goal, it's like, you you might have changed yourself uh, as an individual or you may not get to that goal but you've actually um achieved something else that you never even thought of or a change within yourself i mean all stories are sort of based around that as well and talking about stories and storytelling so um given your extensive background in both entertainment and corporate communication how do you integrate uh, principles of storytelling into your coaching sessions for startup founders and i know you mainly teach pitching is that correct um Peter? yeah yeah that's right um yeah. uh i think i i i'm still sort of sort of struggling with that in a sense of mm. of of how to um you know how to communicate that clearly in terms of of um of being able to take elements and apply them successfully, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, I mean, the, a couple, from a narrative point of view, there's two things that are really highly connected. One is um, the hero's journey, yeah. uh, which um, I'm not sure where that originated. Uh, but it's been used, you know, like uh, uh, frequently uh, across sort of storytelling, um, and and so the hero's journey is 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 basically the reluctant hero gets put forward a task that they may or may not want to take on, and then maybe they reluctantly take on the task, and then they they go and meet the first obstacle, mm -hmm. and it's a challenge, and they may be fail or they maybe succeed and then there's a bit of oh that was great that was easy but then the next challenge is is even worse yeah. and then you know how do we overcome that and maybe maybe that one fails and so then there's a bigger challenge coming up and yeah. ultimately you know in the narrative sequence before the end of the film or the play or or the story yeah. there is an ultimate confrontation with the 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 biggest um the, the biggest Protection. villain yeah or or in yeah. in the 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 legend of beowulf which was the 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 impetus for hamlet which is you, you meet the mother of the problem mm -hmm. you you meet the the originator so in in beowulf it's the mother of the dragon mm -hmm. so you've fought this dragon you've killed this dragon and save the village but now you've actually brought the mother of the dragon alive that is you know and so you have to con and, and in terms of psychology it's getting to the real heart of the problem so we have this manifestation of of a problem which might be nervousness about public speaking but yeah. what's causing that yeah. What is causing that manifestation? And so mm -hmm. you're going to keep experiencing that nervousness until you understand what causes that, you know, where does that come from? Yeah. And um, so, so that hero's journey approach then was sort of looked at by a guy called Robert McKee in, in, who was a, a, a sort of storyteller but an academic. And so he wrote this book called Story uh, and and then he adapted principles 
of that thesis, that mm-hmm. story thesis, uh, to corporate storytelling. And he talked about the build-up of tension and release, mm-hmm. tension and release. And so that's part of the hero's journey is that, you know, we've got this problem. Can you help us solve it? You know, oh, okay, if I must. Uh, and then, uh, okay, that, so that's the first. We've got, okay, problem solved. We've got a hero. And uh, then the hero has the first battle and loses badly. And it's like, oh, no, this is terrible. So then you've, you've got this tension because we're about to be attacked again. Uh, but then, okay, let's, let's formulate a strategy. Oh, the strategy worked. Hey, you know, we've got a release of tension. And that, that hero's journey is tension release, tension release, tension release mm-hmm. until the ultimate thing. And so in terms of applying those principles to a pitch, you're sort of taking the audience into an area where there is a problem. And then, uh, and then so our solution then becomes, uh, uh, but it's okay, we've got this solution. Uh, however, when we applied to the solution to the marketplace, the marketplace said that's not exactly what we want. So then we got the tension again. Okay, so then when we talked to the customer, we found out what we really wanted and we adjusted and they started to like it. So you got that. Mm-hmm. And then, however, the market is huge and vast and global. How are we going to surmount that? Well, we've got these plans that we're putting in effect and, and you know, that, that may lead us to the golden path. So it's, you know, like trying to apply that sort of, those sort of narrative elements. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, that, that's sort of one way of sort of looking at it. And then the other, the other way, which, which is sort of a, um, you're looking at narrative mechanisms being applied to, to, to your pitch, if you like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, and I think one of the principles that Robert McKee took from his analysis of story and the hero's journey what he took then to corporate and looked at corporate and corporate was trying to say, everything is wonderful with us. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we are your perfect ally because everything we do works. <laughs> and so the, the, for the enterprise customer, they have this succession of people coming in and saying, we are amazing. Everything we do is incredible. And the, the, the customers are saying, I don't believe any of that. And then someone comes along and says, you know, um, we we worked with with somebody last year and and when we applied our solution at first, it was abysmal failure, but we worked with the customer and found out why it was a failure and together we were able to achieve this sort of success and we modified what we did and they modified what they did and we were able to create a really great outcome for them and they're now a market leader. Yeah. And so that story, which involves real world drama, challenge mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. overcoming challenge yeah. and difficulty is much more appealing. So that's what he was finding. <laughs> Pardon <Absolutely>. me. <clears throat> yeah. I, I did a, um, a course with a, uh, Mark W. Travis, they call him the director's director. So I've done some courses with him because I really enjoy that area. And with the, um, the storytelling course, he starts off and says, I'm going to tell you a story about Jill and Jack. They were sweethearts at school. Jill was the, the, the head of the cheerleaders. Jack was the, you know, the, the main guy in the football team. They had a fantastic romance. They were the queen of the prom, uh, you know, the couple, and then they ended up getting married. They bought a really nice house. And uh, anybody getting bored already? <laughs> right? And he said, you know, that's, you need to bring in, you know, conflict and obstacles and drama and all of that just to make it interesting, obviously. So that's sort of, in a way, is what you're saying as well. Yeah, I guess, and yeah. and you know, particularly in the startup world, w- one of the things that I say to startup or, or, or sort of theories that I espouse, if you like, is that the startup founder is like a journalist, mm-hmm. and they're actually in Gaza, right. and they're telling the world what is happening in Gaza, and so mm-hmm. you may have 
<clears throat> pardon me, a solution that is for health professionals who are working in hospitals and suffering trauma and burnout. Mm -hmm. And so you may have a solution there. And so for you and the people that you're building the solution for, that is their day-to-day -day life. For the audience that you're talking to, that is not their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So when you describe that experience and bring that experience to life with anecdotal evidence, yeah. that is incredibly compelling. Mm -hmm. And so what I find a lot in founders' pitches is that they're talking about ideas, the idea of a solution, mm -hmm. even the idea of a problem, as opposed to the real world. And so that's that sense that we spoke about earlier about knowledge, academic knowledge, theoretical knowledge and markets. Yes. And sometimes they are, the, the real world knowledge just obliterates theory. What, what is it Mike Tyson says? You, you have a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's, that's what the markets are like and that's what customers are like. Yeah. I remember a founder in Singapore who was building an online supermarket. We were uh, having dinner and he said, mm -hmm. our customers are brutal. He said, you, you, deliver, uh, you deliver a package to them with their groceries, you crack one egg <laughs> and it's all over Facebook. I'm never <laughs> using these people again. They're useless. Oh. <laughs> uh. Uh, and, and that's that sort of brutal world. So I think, you know, in terms of narrative, that when founders are talking about the issues that they're trying to solve, bringing it, bringing it to life with real world experience of customers and defining, defining a problem, for example, or even a solution in terms of the experience that people go through, you know, what, what, what happens when they use a really yeah uh simple interface versus yeah. using something that is really complicated and time consuming and doesn't work and you know that that sort of experience that user experience is really what absorbs people in the way that you were describing with travis uh sorry with jack and jill and yeah. the perfect story <laughs> yeah exactly um so i mean you've trained a lot of people to pitch and uh, there's there'd be so many I, I mean would it be thousands do you think in the thousands uh I'm getting there i think um okay. right. I, I have tried to well, i have done this exercise where i've quantified the the number of accelerator programs i've worked with and yeah. multiplied that by the number of people in the cohort and okay it's yes yeah, so since 2012 to to now mm. so that's you know okay. 11 years okay so from all those pictures, is there one that is memorable and stands out to you? There's, there's many. Um, there's many. I think <laughs> uh, I, I remember seeing one pitch by a Vietnam company uh, that was working in Antler in Singapore. Uh, and, and they've gone on to be really uh, successful. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a bit embarrassing, but um, th they, they came to a session for the, for the first time as we were getting close to the demo day. And so I hadn't seen them and I hadn't seen them in the pitch session. So this was the first time I'd seen their pitch. And they sat down and they, they went through their pitch and it was like a three-minute, three-and-a-half-minute pitch or whatever the duration, the mandated duration was. It was a short pitch. And it was really comprehensive in the sense of uh, it really simply articulated all of the key elements that you need to articulate in the pitch. Mm -hmm. And so I sat there and I thought, yeah, the, the problem is really well articulated. The solution is showing us how they solve the problem. It's not that those two things are really aligned. They're, they're defining their traction really clearly. We're seeing the market, you know, everything. And then they came to the end and their ask was uh, really well substantiated in terms of what they needed to do and how much that would cost and, and what that impact would have on their business. And it was just really clearly articulated. And I said, 
hey, that, that's fantastic. You know, that, that's really good. I really like that. Slides were really clear. And I said, that, that's, that's just great. I said, how did you get that? And they said, oh, we missed your session, but we got the recording. So we just applied everything that, that you said into it, to our pitch. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know? So basically I saw what I had, my process dictates I want to see. Uh, and and I found that really embarrassing, you know. Like, and and so there's a bias that I have for every pitch that if it satisfies the things that I'm trying to teach, then I think it's a good pitch. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily <laughs> true. <laughs> um, uh, the 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 I think the ones that really stand out for me though are, <clears throat> pardon me, when. When you know that the and, and I've seen this in Jakarta a number of times, particularly with female founders, and um, and and the two female founders in particular that I'm recalling, one was a, a health professional. She was a, a health. She she had been a nurse, and she, you know, became a senior administrator at hospitals. Yeah. Uh, in in Indonesia, and her husband was an obstetrician, I think, um, and um, and and they were creating a solution for females in remote areas of mm. Indonesia. You know, so that's on the one of the fourteen thousand or seventeen thousand islands. You know, where they don't have ideal health solutions, but they need it. So they were providing this thing, and so she was really well versed in her profession yep. but terrified of public speaking terrified mm-hmm. of communicating her proposition to the audience mm-hmm. and yet she was the best qualified person to be doing this mm-hmm. probably apart from her husband but he was busy tending to patients you know mm-hmm. uh, and and but but she was she was the one who was doing the pitch and so just nurturing her to a point where she was able to be confident enough to give that pitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there was another woman that I recall that was in a, in a sort of HR type business. And she was very, very similar into incredibly competent, really well experienced, knew everything about her business, mm-hmm. but terrified of standing up, particularly mm-hmm. in front of a room dominated by males who were mm-hmm. judging you. Mm-hmm. On you know, is this a good business idea? Does it yeah. does it make sense? Am I going to who is this person pitching? Mm-hmm. You know, and they're feeling really daunted by that. So being able to help people get to a point where they can deliver that with confidence and and comfort um, that's th- really that's always triumphant for me. Yeah, yeah, that that's a wonderful story. And and uh, what tips would you have for somebody out there listening, a new founder that they what, need to go and pitch and they're, they're terrified? To do that, what what tips could you give them to to help in that situation? Um, the 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 big the the biggest tip I think is that is that th- this is this is your story, and do you do you believe in your story? Mm. And I'm sure you do. And then communicate that belief. Yeah communicate that belief and 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 so that's got to do with trusting yourself yeah. and you don't have to be right but you're communicating your belief mm. i know this is a problem i believe this approach that we're taking with our solution will address that problem yeah, yeah. the evidence that we have is when we apply this solution to an imaginary problem it, it appears to work. So our next step is to take it to the market. And w- look, nobody knows the future. No. And you're talking about the future, you know, and you don't know. And the people on the other side of the room, they don't know either. Maybe they think they know because they analyse so many businesses and they have this tower of knowledge that they sit upon, but they still make the mistakes. They reject successful businesses mm-hmm. and they back unsuccessful businesses. Yeah. So nobody knows the future, uh, but you have belief. And so I think that is really important. And then the other thing is that that you you are involved in truth. 
<laughs> so your investigations and your application of knowledge is is factual. And so in terms of what you're pitching, you're you're saying we have this defined experience or, or not defined experience, it's actual experience that's mm-hmm. led us to this point. Yeah. And on that basis, we believe that we can create a successful future. So the truth is what you have discovered and what you have achieved. Mm-hmm. That, that, is, that is binary. And yeah. so that is your basis for belief. And that is giving you the confidence to believe that we can create a successful future. So it's yeah. believe in your truth, know your truth, trust yeah. yourself, and don't be ashamed. Don't mm-hmm. worry about being judged because everybody's wrong about the future. You know, the, yeah. the economists have a 5% success rate of predicting um, what, what's the, the recessions. <laughs> e- economists with yeah. all of the knowledge are, are wrong when it comes to yeah. predicting recessions. Yeah, that's no, interesting. <laughs> I used to have a friend who used to say, I don't care what other people think, they don't pay me to live. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's hard when you yeah. feel you're really an experience coming up against very experienced people. Yeah. You know, yeah, you that, that's hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just being yourself. And like even on this podcast, sometimes I think, well, I mean, I'm interviewing experts and people, you know, different experiences. And, you know, I've been on a six-year journey. But when I started, I knew nothing about business. I haven't got a business background at all. But I thought, but I can sort of bring, just be myself and bring my unique personality to it. And, you know, and and my purpose is to help um, early-stage founders, you know, that were in the position that I was in. So... Um, sometimes, you know, we do feel intimidated by people that have a lot more knowledge, but I, I guess what I'm doing is good because, you know, you have a lot more knowledge in a certain area and every guest I guess get on does as well, but then they're sharing that knowledge with everybody. So, um, one thing I was going to ask you as well, because I used to do some video work actually, um, in a training organization, I used to, um, video teachers and get them to, you know, just present to camera and that sort of thing. And so many of them, uh, it's, you know, even myself, when I started presenting the camera, people are really, really nervous. And so I actually developed a, a course um, called How to Present to Camera um, Using Your Phone Professionally. And um, what I found in my research on that and my experience of interviewing lots and lots of um, teachers was um, scripts don't really work. People become sort of robotic. I mean, if you're a professional actor, sure, you know, you can work. Um, but generally, people like they're th- looking. At, I think even they look to one side or the other when they're they're thinking about their lines. So what I used to advise is always just have the main points outlined, and then practice until you feel absolutely confident with it. Even if you say it different every time, but you you're just completely confident with it. And I think. What, what are your thoughts on that scripts in pictures or what are your thoughts on the best way to, to do it? When the, I think the difficulty, the, the, a lot of the pictures that I've worked with people on are for events, you know, so it's a, mm-hmm. it's a show, it's mm-hmm. a defined event, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, and because it's a defined event, the event will be on this day mm-hmm. at this time. Yeah. And so you and, and, you know, obviously I come from show business and show business has a dedicated process to get mm-hmm. people ready for opening night. Mm-hmm. And so you have a rehearsal period where you yeah. go through the content and you, 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 you l- look at how to bring that content to life mm-hmm. moment by moment, unit by unit, scene by mm-hmm. scene. Uh, play by play, whatever. So that's a rehearsal period, and and you're basically working working on on bringing that content to life. So then you get to a stage with the actors where they they know their lines, they know how to make the scene work. They're, they're all proficient. Then you go through a different process where you're marrying the prepared actors and their scenes. To the technology, 
and that's mm -hmm. the lighting and the setting and the costume mm -hmm. and the props. Yep. And so that's a new process. And then you go through that and then you do the full dress rehearsal, whereas you're running the show uninterrupted, flawlessly. Mm -hmm. All of the mistakes have been ironed out in the technical yep. process. And now we've, we've got all of the mistakes. And before we go to the audience, we practice doing the show flawlessly. And so that when mm -hmm. we go to the audience, it's a flawless preparation. Okay. So for a demo day, that's the process that I take founders through. Okay. Okay. So we develop a, a, a real knowledge of our content. And most of the time it is with, uh, without, without, um, without a script so that the, so that they're, they're, they're learning their pitch. And they're mm -hmm. refining their content so that at each point in the pitch, you know, whether it's to do with opportunity or validation or execution or whatever, at each point yeah. of that content, they're, they're communicating the key elements and they're, that they're in control of, of the script. And then they get ready to, to deliver. So when you're preparing that same sort of content for a boardroom meeting, with an investor, yeah. it's the same process, but you you don't apply the same rigor to the process. Mm -hmm. um, but you you you're ba so so for some people, they work better with a dedicated script. Mm -hmm. um, but that creates anxiety because if you get a word wrong, it throws yeah. you. You know, exactly. and so then the process of not getting a word wrong is relentless repetition until mm -hmm. you know all of the words, but then you're not ready for the audience because once you know all of that script, the next stage is to make that fluid, mm -hmm. is to be able to do it time and time again without a mistake. And so when you get to that stage where you do it time and time again without a mistake, then you don't have to think. And then mm -hmm. you can immerse yourself in the moment of each part of the pitch, knowing mm -hmm. that when the next slide comes, you're going to tell that story. So it's similar to, to actors. I mean, they, yes. they, they turn up on set, they know their script, the good ones, yes. they know their script, and then they play that character. Yep. You know? Okay, yeah. so here's another analogy. You're a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. or you're a classical musician. Yeah. In both cases, you need to be master of your instrument. You have yeah. to be master of your instrument. And yeah. so in a sense, in, in a sense, if you're applying that to a startup founder, that is that um, uh, I, I'm in control of my body language. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I haven't got my hands in my pockets playing with, things that are in my pocket. I'm not scratching myself. Um, I, I'm speaking clearly so that people can understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to mumbling or, or racing through your content that, yeah. you know, there, there's certain mastery of, of simple things like mm -hmm. your, you know, your, your make sure your gesture is aligned with what you're talking about and your, yeah. your expression and all of that sort of stuff. So that's like a mastery of your instrument. Now, if you're a jazz musician, you're playing to a standard template of, you know, this is the verse, this is the chorus, but you're improvising throughout. So every time you play that song, you play it differently. Yeah. And then the classical musician who's doing Beethoven's Fifth, they have to play every note that's written on the page mm -hmm. and they have to play it to the interpretation of the conductor who's yeah. bringing the whole orchestra together in all of its various components to create a, a single whole. Yeah. And so the people who work best with a script are like the classical musicians yeah. and the people who don't work well with a script are like the jazz musicians. But yeah. both of you need that foundation of mastery. Yeah. Uh, and that mastery is when I tell my story, I know the key components I have to get across, which is the jazz musician, or I know exactly the sequence that I'm going to communicate, mm -hmm. which is the classical, but I'm able to tell that story that when people listen to me and look at me, they can hear and understand 
what I'm communicating. So I'm not sure if I answered the question. No, but great analogy. I, I love it. Yeah, because everyone's different as well. Ab absolutely. Yeah. And for some people, read it. Mm. Read it. Mm -hmm. You know, for some people, if, if you, particularly where you don't have time to commit to the process, mm. in some cases, it may be best for you to read it. And yeah. so then what you're doing, <clears throat> and then you still have to bring that to life. Yeah. You can't read it in a boring manner. You've got to animate it. You know, you've got to be expressive. Um, because sometimes when we write, we write to be read and it's just correct, boring, grammatical language. Yeah. And so you still got to bring that to life. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, if you're preparing for a, a, a demo day and you've got time to commit to the process, you can, you can do it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we can help you get there. If you haven't got the time uh, and it's really high stakes, so, for example, there was a government program I was involved with recently where there's 23 um, local businesses around Sydney, local mm. businesses that are communicating their ideas for their, their, their local business district, yeah. okay? And yeah. they've got to run a business day to day. Mm. They, you know, yeah. they haven't got really so so developing their content and putting them in a position of public speaking to three hundred people, mm. uh, which is really really confronting because they've never done this sort of thing before. Yeah. You know, for them or for some of them, reading their script is a way of them managing to communicate mm. clearly and and overcome their fears of public speaking for the first time, but they're doing it in a high stakes environment. So then, then giving them the, the, the repeated experience of standing at a lectern and reading from their script and communicating with an audience, mm -hmm. that's going to get you there. And then yeah. as they develop experience, then they can get off script when they got the time to commit to the process. Yeah. So it's really that depends on the person and it also depends on the nature of the event and the commitment to the process. No, that's, that's great advice. And so I guess to, to wrap up, Peter, it's been really interesting. So if you could give one piece of advice to an early startup founder, what would that be? Just commit to what you're trying to do and try every single thing you can to make it work and exhaust yourself in the process of trying to make it work. And when you get to a position of, I don't think this is working, then uh, like the trader in financial markets, if you're in a bad position, get out and, and start again. Yeah, great advice. One thing I would add to that, exhaust yourself, but you know, maintain your, your, your well-being and your mental health. <laughs> With exercise, diet, and sleep, etc. Um, yeah, 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 great. And and also, yeah, that whole thing about you know when do you get out? I mean, I've had that conversation before, and you know, in hindsight, you can see, oh, you know, I should have got out, you know, a year ago, two years ago, whatever. Um, and that's something you should probably use your intuition for as well. You know, like if you're getting a lot of signs like this, really, it's really not working, and it's not adding up, and you know, maybe that's time to have a good hard think about you know what else you, and and you know if you're young or even if you're not you, you can always start again and um you've got all like you said before it's it's about the journey it's all about the experience that you've gained i know the american vcs i'll take on startup founders that have other startups that haven't worked out because of the experience they've got in, in australia we have a bit of an issue with the whole failure thing that we've talked about um you know, it's it has a worse connotation, I, I think, or like a bad connotation for some people. But you know, I'm trying to change that. Um, so failures are good; they're good. That's how we mm. learn. Oh, oh absolutely. And and right. for for venture capitalists, their their position is very similar to the startup. You know, they're trying to make investments work yeah. for their investors. Mm. You know, they have a mandate to deliver performance. They have a mandate to deliver success. And so they're trying to find on behalf of their investors likely successes. And, you know, they're, they're, they're back in the, in the 
cut and thrust of financial markets. If they succeed more than they fail, <laughs> they will they they will yeah. they will do well. But if yeah. they fail more than they succeed, they're out the door. Yeah, you know. Um, so it's it's you know ev- everybody's sort of in the same boat. Uh, and um, I think you know believe in what you're doing, absolutely give it your best shot, uh, and and learn to trust your own. Uh, instincts yeah great advice and um, yeah I really appreciate you being on and um, sharing all your wisdom um, it's interesting because I, I, I love working with actors um, I find them really interesting people we have great conversations and they know how to have fun you know in general and so um, I know that's your background and it's been interesting it's been fun and it's been um, great um, conversing with you Peter I really appreciate your your time today No worries. Thanks, Paul.